Hi folks and welcome to another episode of the Jet Fuel Only channel. Today we're talking about drag racing. I'm going to be sharing all the things I've learned in the last 15 years or so of recreational drag racing so that you can go out and have a good time drag racing yourself. Now I'm sure you've seen your friends post their time slips or videos on the Facebook groups or the forums and you're thinking, I kind of want to do that but I don't want to make a fool of myself. Well don't worry, today I'm going to show you everything you need to know to do it confidently. Now I know this is a bit of a long video, uh, so I've got you covered. Check the description box below, there are some time links and you can jump ahead to the portions that are most important to you. Or you can just move the slider to the times listed here on the side. Now the first part is a little more focused on the CTS V Sport, my car, where I'm going to talk about going to the track and the things I'm going to do at this visit to try and get a faster time. Then we're going to get to the track and I'm going to talk a little bit about drag racing culture. We're going to have some interviews with a couple of people. And then in the third part, we're going to talk about how the drag racing actually works. And this part is definitely for everybody. After that, I'm going to break down the time slip so you can read your time slip properly and you know what information it's giving you. And lastly, I'm going to share with you how bracket racing works. That's right, you can do competition with elimination rounds and no matter how fast or slow your car is, you can race and you could win. So stick around, we'll go do some drag racing, and I think you'll learn something. Let's do it. I am currently in terrible Bay Area traffic, doing 10 miles an hour. On my way to the drag strip, it's about an hour and a half drive with this traffic, and that sucks. But at least, after all this slow driving, I get to go fast. So that's right, we're headed to Sonoma Raceway. It's uh, just north of San Francisco. Uh, they have, of course, a big uh, racetrack and they have a drag strip. And on Wednesday nights, they often have uh, drag racing open to all. It's been mm, probably eight months since I've last drag raced. And back then the car wasn't running great. I had spark plug and coil issues. And since then I've changed those out as you've seen in one of my other videos. But uh, tonight, hopefully we're gonna see the car running as it should, good spark plugs. Um, I'm using 91 gas, of course, that's what we get here in California. I didn't get any race gas or anything. Uh, so hoping to also shoot some footage to put together this video that you're watching now. I'm going to try something new. Um, I do run autocross tires 24 seven as my daily tires. They're not, uh, non-street legal. They're still 200 tread wear. Uh, they're very soft and they grip like hell, but they're really good at lateral grip and their sidewalls are super stiff though. And when you want to go drag racing, really a drag radial or a specialized drag uh, tire, like a drag slick, is designed with a soft sidewall. The idea behind that is that it flexes and it allows the tire to really spread out on the pavement and get a nice big contact patch as it grips the pavement launching um, from the start. So I've kind of got good and bad going. These tires grip amazingly, but they're not going to flex like they should on the launch. So I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, I've used these tires before and uh, I get 1.960 foot. So if you had a good drag radial, you could probably get what, 1.760 foot and with a real drag slick, maybe 1.6, 1.5, I think I've seen ATS Vs do. No one's done that stuff in, this, in the V Sports yet. Uh, I know a couple of guys out there that have got their drag set up, but they haven't really uh, had a chance to put it to test yet. So I'm really looking forward to seeing some really good 60 foot times from those who have invested proper tires. They have also done something else different, and that is uh, my tire pressure monitoring system. You see, in this car, if the tire pressure monitoring system picks up that your tire pressures have dropped below, I think it's 27 PSI, uh, the indication goes amber and it won't let you take traction control off. And that's a problem because traction control is actually gonna slow you down if it has to activate on your launch. So 
I want to turn off traction control, but I want to lower my tire pressure because uh, softer tires, lower tire pressure is going to allow for more contact patch at the launch. So today I used my uh, tire pressure reset tool. They're like 12 bucks on Amazon or whatever. And I uh, synced up my rear tire pressure monitors of the car, what the car thinks is the rear tires to wheels that aren't even on the car. So then when I go drive, it uh, later says, hey, wait a second, you don't have tire pressure monitors in your tires. And uh, it just gives me a little warning, but the system still lets me turn off traction control. So today I'll be able to manually check my tire pressures, get them down to maybe 25, 26 PSI, maybe even a little lower and see how it goes. You go too low and you start uh, maybe causing damage to these stiff sidewalls that my autocross tires have. Uh, so uh, hoping to bring that tire pressure down, get a little more grip, and I'm really looking for at least a low 1.9, maybe a 1.8, high 1.8, 60 foot. That would be amazing. And generally, at the speeds uh, and times I'm running, a tenth in the 60 foot equals two tenths in the quarter mile. Currently, my best quarter mile time in this car is uh, 12.5. Uh, I think it was at 112 on 91 gas. So let's say uh, that I could get a better 60 foot. That 12.5 was run on a 1.95 60 foot. If I ran a 1.85 60 foot, I could log a 12.3 quarter mile time. So uh, maybe a little better 60 foot time today and then uh, which equals a little better quarter mile time. Either way, we're going out to have fun and uh, just see what the car does and maybe learn to drive a little bit better. seem to be a little weak but uh, you know tires are attached batteries attached you know the fire hazards so sweet smell of fresh burnt rubber and tire smoke. This and the literally sweet smell of burning race gas are distinctive odors in the air while visiting the drag strip. At the same time, you will enjoy the soundtrack of tires squealing, engines revving, accelerating, as well as engines purring at idle. While you try to wait patiently for your turn to run the quarter mile, you'll see many things. Drivers chatting with each other, of course car talk is all that's allowed. Men and women are discussing technique, sharing experiences, and of course, comparing their cars. Some people spend time getting their tire pressures right, recalibrating ECUs, or reviewing their data logs, but everyone has a ritual on how they do things, at least the ones that have been here before. The newbies are just here having fun, they're checking out their cars and trying to figure out how to do better. Spectators wander around the staging lanes just to get a look at the cars that are going to run and guess how fast they are. Bring a snack, water, and take some notes because each run down the drag strip will probably be less than 15 seconds, but you'll have sometimes an hour between runs, just enough time to mill over why your car didn't run what you thought it would. I'm one of those people that mill over my runs. I analyze my time slips and chat with other drivers to see what I can learn. Of course, as a fan of sports sedans and Cadillacs, I like to chat with those who have cars I admire the most. All right, here we're uh, here with Norberto. I just met him. He's got this uh, beautiful uh, black CTS V3. So you come out here and drag race much? Not much. This is my third time coming out. Third time. Third All time. right. With this car? Yeah, with this car. Nice. And how's it running today? It's running pretty good. I'm doing like about 12.3. I 
my best time is 12 flat, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. Nice. Yeah. All right. We're about to do the brackets, uh, so we might get eliminated. Uh, I don't know yeah. how good he is with the light, but uh, I seem to screw it up a lot. So. I screw it up, too, so <laughs> we'll see. We're just having fun. That's right. So what kind of mods do you have on the car? Anything? Uh, nothing right now. Just the uh, intake system. That's it. Uh, the rest is still stock. So, How long uh, have you had the car? A little over a year. It's a uh, LT4. Uh, 640 uh, horsepower, supercharged. So, best car you've had ever? Best car ever. <laughs> I, nice. Hands down. Now you said you have other Cadillacs. What I do you have? I have other Cadillacs. I have a 2007 Escalade. I have a 2015 CTS uh, V6, and I have another uh, 2005 CTS nice. V6. Nice. Yeah. This man is committed to Cadillac. Cadillac's the way I'm to go. I'm just on my first one. We'll see what happens next. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. Roberto. Thanks, All man. Right, thanks. All right, so now I've got Drew here. I just met Drew. How's it going? I love his shirt. It's Cletus. I'll give a shout out to Cletus. I run on freedom. I think that's awesome. So, uh, hey, Cletus, you know, new YouTube channel here. Help yeah. me out, man. <laughs> No, I love your show. All right. Uh, Drew here has this, what year is it? 2017 Chevy SS. 2017 Chevy SS. Same color as my car, pretty much. You know I love that color. And I know this is a Cadillac channel, but it doesn't have to be. We love all sports sedans, and there's nothing like the G8. Oh, wait, I mean SS, right? SS. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, Drew, how long you had the car? Uh, so I've had it since November of last year. All right, not too long, and you've well, already modded it. November of the previous oh, year. Oh, previous year. All right. So about a year and a half. All right, cool. What have you put into it so far? Uh, so I have intake, headers, E85, and 17s. And that's it. Too. That E85 is pretty good. Yeah. Drew and I are actually running very, very similar times. Both of us have run 12 fours today, right? Yep. At 112. Yep. 112. Yeah. Crazy. I think it's that's really awesome. Uh, those uh, slicks he's got there are pretty badass. What kind of 60 foot are you running? Uh, it's my best so far is this last one. I did 185. Nice. Cool. Well, thanks for talking to me, Drew. Yeah. Drag racing on the surface is simple. Two cars line up at the starting line, the lights go yellow, then green, and the two cars go as fast as they can in the quarter mile. They may be racing each other or just testing out to see how fast their car can go. Once they reach the finish, their elapsed time, ET, and mile per hour show up on the boards at the end of the track. Once your engine is started, be sure to do everything you need to do to have your car go its fastest. In the CTS, I use the mode selector to choose either sport or track mode. Both are fine for drag racing, but the throttle curves are different. You should also turn off traction control by pressing the TCS button. If you accidentally spin the tires on the launch and traction control is on, it'll stop the rear wheels from spinning momentarily and possibly pull ignition timing which decreases horsepower. The timing may not recover by the time you do your run. I actually recommend using Stabilitrack competitive mode. Press TCS twice in two seconds. In this mode, the car will only intervene if the car gets too sideways for some reason. Or you can turn off all traction and stability control by pressing and holding the TCS button for five seconds you'll see the TCS and Stabilitrack lights come on. Also, if you plan to do a burnout, you'll want to be in manual mode to do that. If you aren't doing one, just keep it in automatic. As you're waved forward to the starting line, you'll see a wet area. This is the water box. This area is a place where you can put your rear wheels and help get a burnout going. Do you need to do a burnout? On street tires, it's generally not recommended. Go around the water box in the dry area, and if you want, do a quick little dry burnout to clean the tires off. Many street tires just get greasy and slippery instead of stickier. However, try different techniques and see what gets you the most traction. Follow the track worker's instructions, and then he'll put your rear tires in a good spot for the burnout. If you use the water box, wait for your cue that it's safe to do so, and don't slide into anyone or the wall. After the burnout, don't forget to go back to automatic mode for the fastest shifts. Once your burnout is done, or you've driven past the water box, look for the timing beams and approach slowly. At first it's hard to tell where it is, so drive up while watching the staging light. If they flash on and off, then you went too far and you need to back up a few inches and try again. So let's break these lights down and see what we see. 
The top of the tree has two light bulbs. These are the pre-staging lights. As you roll your car up to the starting line, the lights illuminate when your car's tires break the first of two infrared beams. And this tells you that your car is about to be completely staged and ready to go. You can stop here for a second, but then you need to roll forward. Roll a few inches further and you'll break the second infrared beam and the second set of lights comes on to say that the car is fully staged. Some racers choose to do a deep stage where they roll a little bit farther till the first lights, the pre-stage lights, turn off. Because the timer starts when your tires stop locking the second beam, if you're deep staged, there's less time necessary for your wheels to roll and unblock the beam and start the timer. Both regular staging and deep staging work fine, but practice one and stick with it. Once staged, or deep staged, and you have an automatic, you might hold the brake with your left foot and gas with the right foot to preload the engine, build boost, or simply to decrease the time it takes to get rolling. Shortly after both cars are staged, the yellow lights will count down towards the bottom. These flash in sequence 0.5 seconds apart. All these do is give your brain an extra 1.5 seconds to get ready as the green light approaches. We call the sequencing of lights a sportsman tree. At certain competitions and tracks, a pro tree is used. With a pro tree, all three yellow lights flash at the same time, and only four tenths of a second later, the green light comes on. This gives your brain little time to process and you must be ready to go. Once the green light comes on, your car may break away from the staging lights. However, because it takes many hundredths of a second for your brain to see a green light, for your body to react and push the gas pedal, and then for your car to begin to roll, you don't want to wait for the green light to go. It is generally the recommended technique to see the last yellow and start the physical process of go at that time so that the car leaves the staging beams by the time the light turns green. The time it takes for this to happen is your reaction time, but it doesn't affect your quarter mile time while doing practice runs. However, you should always practice your reaction times if you intend to compete one day. Let's look closely at my launch versus the lights. If you listen, you'll hear my left foot let off the brake as my right foot advances the throttle while the last yellow light is on. Then you'll also see the hood of the car rise slightly up as the rear end squats in the launch. And shortly after that, the light is green. This demonstrates that I started the go process before the green light even came on, but I leave the light as the light turns green. If you do end up leaving just before the green, you'll get a red light like I did here. This doesn't matter in practice, but it tells you that you reacted a little too fast. In competition, this would disqualify your run. As I leave the line, I apply full throttle at a rate that works good for my car. Once the throttle is pinned, I hold on and just drive straight. This is the beauty of an automatic. If you have a manual gearbox, learn to shift quickly and accurately. Do not try to use paddle shifters on an automatic car to shift. You'll most likely not perform as well as the computer shifting. After you pass the finish line, let off the gas and begin braking. There's lots of room, but don't go off the end into the sand. Many tracks have an early and late turnoff. If the turnoff is to the right and you are in the left lane, for example, don't cut off the other driver. They have the right of way. Maybe they won't make the turnoff, and if you turn, they could drive right into you. Turn down the return road and respect return road speed limits. This is not a place to do another drag run. If you had the AC off and it's hot, go ahead and turn it back on. You will usually come to a time slip booth where hopefully there's a smiling face offering you your time slip so you can see how well you did. All right, I just got done with my first run for the night and uh, I'm actually pleasantly surprised. I got a new personal best, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, I tried something different too. I usually don't go into the water box to do a real burnout. I usually do a dry uh, burnout the best I can and get a little smoke to heat up the tires. But uh, for this time, you know, I used the water box. I was surprised how quickly they spun up, uh, which was really nice. The car felt actually kind of slow. Um, I don't know what it was. It shifted kind of hard, but you know, sometimes it's those slow runs that actually uh, end up with a better time. So let's check out the time slip. Now remember a quarter mile is equal to 1,320 feet. So looking at the time slip from top to bottom, the first line is the dial or dial in. We'll talk about this one later. The next line is the reaction time. This is the time it took for you to react to those lights and get the car moving off the staging beam. It's measured in seconds. In this case, mine was negative 0.020. The best time is 000. Anything less is a red light, as you saw. 
The next line is the 60 foot. This is 60 feet of the 1320 feet in the quarter mile. The 60 foot is obviously 60 feet after the staging lights or the start line, and it's a good indication of how well you launched your car. On street tires, you should be looking around 2.0 seconds on a Cadillac CTS. If you get into the 1.8s, good job. With drag radials or slicks, a car can often pull 1.5 to 1.7 60 foot times. Spinning your wheels will result in a higher 60 foot time. Also, getting on the throttle too slowly will result in a high time as well. This is where skill and knowing your car come in. Next is the 330 foot time. Not that important for most automatics, but if you have a manual, it can tell you how efficient your first one or two shifts were. Next is the 660 foot or eighth mile. It's halfway down the track. In this case, I went 8.086. Some race tracks are only this long, so this may be the end of your run. If not, this is a good indication of your car's low end performance. Next is the eighth mile per hour. How fast were you going at half track? In this case, I was doing 89.29 miles per hour. Next is the 1000 foot mark. You can gather that it's an intermediate info point between the eighth and quarter mile mark. Lastly, we have what we came for, the quarter mile time and mile per hour. In this case, 12.457 seconds at 112.6 miles per hour. So, from leaving the staging lights, not including reaction time, it took the car 12.457 seconds to pass the quarter mile. The mile per hour may not be exactly what your car was showing on the speedometer. It is a calculated number based on the time that you crossed the last 60 feet of track to the quarter mile mark. Also known as the trap speed, your mile per hour is a good indication of horsepower. If you made modifications to the car, not only should your ET decrease, but you should be seeing an increase in miles per hour. All right, so now all we can do is try to improve on that. I mean, it's an automatic. Uh, if I can get a better launch, that's how it's gonna improve my time. Let's hope the car doesn't get heat soaked because the heat soak is gonna uh, have it drawing horsepower and uh, then we won't go quite as fast. So let's see what happens next. At Sonoma Raceway Wednesday Night Drags, you get to start the day with practice runs to see how your car's doing that day. Temperature, humidity, even headwinds can change how your car performs in the quarter. After you've had a time to figure out how well your car's doing and how good you're driving, it's time for the elimination rounds. Everyone that participates gets randomly set up against another car in the class. You compete against each other. The loser goes home while the winner gets to go on to another race until the whole group is whittled down to one winner. The best part about bracket racing is that it doesn't matter how fast your car is. For example, here's a race between a classic muscle car built for drag racing and most likely a stock Toyota Tundra. Obviously the Tundra is likely to be much slower, but in bracket racing, it doesn't matter. Let me explain. After your practice runs, you take the best guess at what quarter mile time your car will run. You take into account that the air is getting cooler as the night goes on. You write your dial-in number, the time you expect to run, on your window. Here I wrote 12.49. For the race between the muscle car and Toyota Tundra, the muscle car dials in 11.65, while the Tundra expects to only run 15.9. So how this becomes a fair race is that each competitor's green light is adjusted for this time difference. The Tundra will get a green light 4.25 seconds before the muscle car. If each competitor runs as they predicted, 
they will both reach the finish line at the exact same time. The car that gets there first wins, as long as they don't run faster than their predicted time. See this flashing light at the top of the timing board? That indicates to us and the driver that he won. It came on early because the Tundra red-lighted and lost the race. But had he not red-lighted, what would have happened? Well, the muscle car dialed in 11.65, but ran 11.658. This is an excellent estimation of the time he would run, and he didn't run faster, which would have been disqualifying. The Tundra, however, failed to estimate his car's performance and ran a 15.387, going much faster than his dial-in. Therefore, he would have lost anyway. In this video, shot on another night, I run my personal best and make it through my first round of brackets. I'm dialed in with a 12.35 as seen on my windshield and the prompter on the top of the screen. The Corvette Z06 has a dial-in of 11.5, so I will get a head start being the slower car. I end up winning. Let's see why. I dialed in 12.35 and at the launch my reaction time was pretty good at .031. Now earlier I said the reaction time doesn't matter except in competition, and we are now competing. This reaction time will be added to my total time. Even if I run my dial in, the additional time of my reaction goes against me when comparing my run to the other driver. So it pays to have a low reaction time. The Corvette was slow to react to the light, it took him a whole .359 seconds to get rolling, so I've already got a lead on him. I'm likely to win based on this, plus my launch was good, and the car performed as expected. I ran 12.370, which is only .020 slower than I predicted. That's pretty good. Mr. Corvette ran .065 seconds slower than he predicted. When we add our reaction times to our ETs, we get the total run time subtracted from the dial-in, and that's how the winner is determined. He was only 0.424 seconds off his prediction, and I was only 0.051 off when we include our reaction times. In this case, I race a Lexus ISF, and we are a closer match for speed, but again, it doesn't matter. I dial in 12.32 to his 12.60. It's clear he got me off the line because my reaction time was 0.05 seconds slower than his. At the end, I run a 12.457 to his 12.692. I'm 0.137 seconds slow on my dial-in, and he's only 0.092 seconds slow. If we add in our reaction times, my slow time is no help, and he still wins by 0.0954 overall. Now, in some universe, could I have won? Well, yes, and it could have simply come down to how well and consistent I could launch my car. My reaction time was not that bad, but on the previous run, my 60 foot was 1.933 instead of 1.997. Every tenth in the 60 foot usually means two tenths in the quarter mile. So if I would have gotten that launch that was only six hundredths faster, I could have had an ET of 12.393, running only 0.037 seconds slower than my dial-in. Even with my slower reaction time, this would have been enough to beat him by 5 thousandth of a second. That's why it's important not only to react well, but be able to launch your car consistently. Well, that's about it to drag racing. I hope you learned a lot from this video. I sure did have fun making it. Now, if you have any other tips about drag racing, be sure to comment in the section below so we can all read about it. And if you really feel like you've learned something from this and that maybe you can get out to your local drag strip and give it a shot, please hit the like button and subscribe because I'll have other cool car videos coming, of course. You can also find me on Instagram at jet.fuel.only. I hope to find you there. Otherwise, thanks for watching the Jet Fuel Only channel. We'll see you next time.